Okay, so <clears throat> let me shortly uh, review a little bit what we are planning to uh, for today. Uh, last week we were discussing dislocation structure in crystals, or we started the first part of it, uh, which was uh, mainly revolving around the Bias Navarro model, which was the historically first way to describe dislocations in crystals. And we have seen a second uh, part of the last lecture was um, uh, dealing with the description of interatomic bonding, which is something that you need if you want to describe um, uh, dislocations in crystals. You cannot uh, use linear elasticity anymore, but you need something which goes beyond that. We have seen several methods. Uh, importantly, we have density functional theory, which is a very precise theory free of parameters, and we have a lot of other methods which are grouped into the term semi-empirical methods, which can provide dislocation uh, structure and also bias stresses and so on, uh, but at um, a lower computational cost, and you can run bigger and more complex calculations. Uh, today, I'm going to focus specifically on FCC and BCC methods. Uh, you will see that the crystal structure is actually very important uh, to understand these locations. And there are different specific uh, aspects to these locations depending on the crystal structure. We will see today how the gamma surface uh, uh, looks like in FCC metals. We have a stacking fault here uh, that plays a very uh, important role in understanding of this location structure. Um, which leads to dissociation and shockley partials. And then I will also uh, explain you a little bit how these locations look in BCC metals, where we have different uh, specific uh, things which have to be uh, kept in mind when trying to understand plasticity in BCC metals. Uh, just a short view on to next week uh, and the program for next week. Uh, we are going to discuss then this location motion and generation. Um, and then, ah, sorry, this is not next week, but um, the, the, in two weeks on 18th of uh, May. And um, then we will have the, my last lecture will be on 25th of May on these locations and strength of crystalline solids. Where we try, or I will try to show you um, how atomic scale quantities and atomic scale phenomena of this location show up in macroscopic experiments and macroscopic behavior of materials. Okay, then there will be the dislocations and epitaxy um, lecture of David, and in the end we will have the student presentations. Okay, let's start with these locations in FCC and BCC crystals. Just a short overview on um, what the periodic table looks like in terms of crystal structures. We see that we have um, a lot of metals which are in a FCC crystal structure, which is shown here in green. You might be familiar with many of them, specifically aluminum, copper, silver, gold, nickel are all very important technologically relevant um, metals. And also historically, most of plasticity model development was done on, uh, for FCC metals uh, and copper was maybe the most investigated material of all. Um, one should also keep in mind that there are a lot of alloys based on iron, which are also FCC, the so-called austenitic steels, where one alloys uh, specific uh, alloying elements so that we get iron stable also at room temperature. Uh, that is also a very important class of FCC metals. Then we have BCC metals, which are also shown here. It's also quite a big portion of the periodic table um, is BCC metals. We see here a very important technological metals, tungsten, molybdenum, tantalum, our refractory metals. Uh, which are used in many applications where we cannot use iron or copper, um, which are related to high temperature applications or 
uh, applications where specific physical properties are required, which uh, these elements have. Uh, high melting point is one, but there are also other specific uh, properties which are relevant. Yeah, also chrome and vanadium are important metals. Then we have here metals which are also BCC, which are maybe not so important in terms of structural materials, but they are also BCC metals, uh, but they are not so much investigated in terms of dislocation behavior. The most important uh, BCC elements for um, dislocations uh, investigations where um, these uh, were uh, tanks, molybdenum, chromium, vanadium, niobium, tantalum, and iron, I would say. Then we have a lot of HCP metals also, which are also very relevant. Um, for example, cobalt um, is and titanium, I just named these two, which are maybe the most important from the technological point of view. Also, rhenium has a certain uh, importance. Uh, and the other ones are maybe not so important, but um, HCP metals are also uh, interesting. They have also very specific properties uh, due to their crystal structure, um, but I'm not going to um, treat in detail HCP crystals. Uh, I will stick to FCC and BCC because these two metals are anyways uh, uh, very rich in their dislocation properties and I don't have the time to go into all crystal structure and all uh, properties of these locations in the different uh, crystal structure. Sometimes students take this topic, I think this year it's not the case, but that's not a problem. Okay, so here I show uh, a very general representation of the two uh, crystal structures that we are going to focus uh, on today. Simple cubic is very exotic, so that's not in our focus, but body-centered body cubic crystal structure and the face-centered cubic uh, crystal structures are shown here. Um, you're probably familiar with these crystal structures. For the body-centered cubic crystal structure, you have an atom exactly in the middle of the cube. So these are all cubic uh, materials, but um, the body-centered cubic crystal structure has the atom in the center and the face center cubic uh, crystal structure has the atom in the faces. And that gives um, a, a completely different crystal structure in, in, if you look in the detail. Let's start with the FCC crystal structure. So <clears throat> it's shown again here, the closed back plane, which uh, usually is the glide plane of uh, a, a crystal. In the case of FCC is the 101 plane which is shown here by these dashed uh, lines. And we have the Burgess vector, which is along the 110 direction. So you can see here, this is the 110 direction, and uh, this corresponds to the Burgess vector in FCC. Let's look a little bit onto the 111 surface of the FCC crystal structure, where we see essentially um, an image like this. So this is what uh, a one on one surface on uh, FCC crystal looks like. You can see we have different colors here, which uh, which correspond to different layers. Um, if you look onto the surface, uh, you can see that we have a hexagonal symmetry uh, and we have three uh, layers that is even seen more clearly if we look from this side here. So if you were to uh, rotate the whole crystal and looking from this side here, we would see um, that we have three different layers, A, B, C, which is ca uh, characteristic to the specific orientation uh, of the FCC crystal. Uh, and we can see that essentially they are, these three layers are displaced with respect to each other and they are all hexagonal, uh, the three layers, but they are shifted relative to each other. And in this representation, looking onto the uh, light plane, we see that the Burgess vector is here, um, uh, nearest neighbor distance within one layer, for example, here in the C layer. Yes, and now it's all about the gamma surface. We have seen the Pius Navarro model in the last lecture, where we worked with a simple one dimensional gamma surface. I just show here as a reminder what we were discussing. 
So uh, the gamma surface, just a short uh, repetition, is the energy change when I shear one layer on top of each other, uh, on top of the next layer. And you can see how the energy varies uh, with a period that is reflected by the period of the crystal lattice. Now, if we go and um, look at the FCC crystal, where we have now ABC stacking, every layer is a one on one uh, closed back plane. And now if I start to shear, um, for example, the layer C with respect to B, I get again a gamma surface, but now in this case, it is more complicated. It looks a little bit like uh, this uh, simple um, gamma surface, but we have to remind that now we are 2D, so we can display this in this direction as shown here, which would correspond to this direction the x direction here. So this is what we would see in terms of the energy when displaced in a long x direction. But we can also go normal to that, which I call here z. And if we did that, we would see this type of energy landscape. So the energy landscape is more complicated than what we have seen last time. And that creates some specific things. Um, I just want to mention here that one can also apply the, uh, the bias Navarro model to this more complex case. Uh, I have shortly mentioned last time that there are some extensions to the bias Navarro model uh, for 2D, and this has been done also by, for example, Schoek. Uh, I will not go into all the details, but I will just show you the most essential things about the dislocation structure and show you a few results uh, done then with other atomistic methods. Professor, excuse me. In yes. the previous slide, mm -hmm. the three-dimensional graphic yes. at variation of x equal to 0 0.8, I think, 0 0.8, the line. Yes, In, yeah. Yes, the, the line e, uh, is, la, uh, if you follow it through all um, set, through all the line of set, there is a very little variation of E in, in this line. Why? You mean this, you mean this wiggle here? Yes, this, this line is, is, is very little. Why? I'm not sure whether I understand it correctly, but are you um, asking why this line has this very small uh, oscillation? Is that what yes, you're asking? Yes, that's my question. Yeah. Okay, so this is um, actually a numeric artifact of, of showing this. Uh, if we were, if I made a plot with a higher resolution, then you would not see this. Um, this comes from the fact that I've uh, read in here, this is actually a copper uh, one on one gamma surface when you calculate specific points with DFT <clears throat> and then you fit and you represent these points in Mathematica, this is the way it looks like. One could then smoothen this, uh, but I have not done it here. Uh, but is, this is uh, not uh, of importance. This very small wiggles here of, of no importance. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, so this is just a numeric uh, uh, small artifact. Uh, it is actually better to fit um, a Fourier series through and then you would not see these wiggles. Uh, yeah. But anyways, uh, the important thing is how this looks like. Actually, I think yeah, here I have done that. Um, after fitting with a Fourier series, you get very smooth uh, energy landscape. Um, and that I could also have shown here, but I have not done that yet. So <clears throat> now we look at, um, at the same uh, surface at the same gamma surface in a contour plot. And just to remind you, here is the minimum. And we can see now here more features. We can better see here that there is one point of this gamma surface, which is very interesting, which corresponds to the stacking fault. And I'm going to explain a little bit what that means. So first, just trying to imagine that we are looking at the one, one, one surface, right? This is the way it looks like. And we started to shift the red layer with respect to the bottom. 
and we would shift it around. And then we would see an energy increase due to that because we are leaving the FCC stacking. There's one point which is very interesting and that is when I start to stack the red on top of the blue, which makes it effectively a blue layer. In that case, uh, you would, uh, you, uh, you, we get a, um, a blue layer and then you can see here that that corresponds to a local HCP stacking. And that is where I am, uh, I am in a, a FCC crystal structure. And that corresponds to a local minimum here, which corresponds to FCC. And that is an important point of the gamma surface. Uh, and that um, uh, is, is very important when we talk about uh, FCC, uh, the crystal structure and dislocation in FCC, because we get something like a dissociation. Here I show again um, how the stacking fault looks like when you look normal, actually. So when we look normal to the 111 surface, what we can see is that we get here a AB, AB, so ABC, ABC would be the normal stacking FCC, but we get ABC and then AB, a, AB, which is the HCP stacking. And that locally introduces a fault. And um, this is uh, the stacking fault. Um, and the stacking fault, since this is also a crystal structure, which is energetically kind of favorable, is not bad. Um, here we have an energy which is almost the same as for the FCC. So the, in the energy difference between FCC and HCP can become very small uh, for materials. It can be high. For example, for aluminum, I will show you later, it can be quite high, but it can be also um, very small. And in that case, if it's very small, um, uh, this point here gets almost uh, energetically the same as this point here. And this is something which is very important because we know from Frank's rule that these locations can dissociate. Um, you can imagine here um, to have two dislocations which have uh, fractional or partial uh, Burgess factors, which add up to the uh, total Burgess factor here as shown in this diagram. And we have seen uh, that in Frank's rule that if the angle here is larger than 90 degrees, then this situation is energetically favorable. And if you look now here, there is uh, the possibility that the Burgess vector, which is originally the um, uh, Burgess vector, the nearest neighbor distance, uh, is the one half 111 uh, Burgess vector. And that is shown here. But we have now an option that the dislocation dissociates into two partial dislocations. Why partial? Because at this point here, we have not um, an FCC crystal structure, but we have an HCP crystal structure and we have to pay some energy. But um, if this energy is small, then uh, there is still dissociation is favorable uh, and that um, creates two shockley partials as I will show you a little bit more in detail here. So, and this is a representation of the dislocation now, um, where we are looking now from the side again. And you can see here, we have an edge dislocation. We have the additional layer inserted here. And if we had no dissociation, essentially we would have a dislocation like we discussed last time, where we go and we stretch the, the layer on top of the second one and um, we introduce the dislocation. And the Burgess vector is just here along the X direction. But now, and that would uh, correspond to this situation here, where the Burgess vector is uh, um, one half of the 110 direction and is not dissociated. But now we have a dissociation and that locally here creates Burgess vector, which have a component, which is not along X, but comes out and has this component along Z. You can see it here comes out and goes back in. This is, corresponds exactly to this situation here. And what we get in addition is the um, stacking fault here. And then you can see that's the region in between 
we can see that we create here a stacking fault. You can see it here that we have A, which goes into B. So here, locally, we have this HCP stacking. We have the stacking fault, which is bordered by, um, by the two partials. And um, that means that the dislocation is dissociated into two uh, Shockley partials. And in between, we have a stacking fault. So a one-dimensional uh, representation or uh, bias Navarro model cannot describe the um, dislocation structure correctly. But what you really need here is to take into account the 2D um, a gamma surface of the FCC crystal. Here I show again a little bit more in detail with the arrows uh, where we are in terms of local um, uh, Burgess factor. If we if you can remember, this was um, the representation of uh, um, the lecture last time. We have a U of X function, which takes us from here to here. Here it is uh, equal to the Burgess vector. And we can see the same here. We go from here to here. Uh, U gradually increases from zero to the Burgess vector, right? And you can see in the undissociated case, it would just run continuously from here to here following this arcus tangens function. But now, since we have the dissociation, it's different. We have a partial. We go into the stacking fault. And then we have, for a certain distance, we just have the stacking fault. And then we go back, and we have the second uh, partial dislocation. And the question now is, how wide is actually the stacking fault? Well, ah, yeah, just before I go into the um, how wide it is, um, I just show here um, a schematic that shows us that the dislocation is here um, divided into two partials with a stacking fault in between. This is a representation which is sometimes used to represent this dissociation. But now go, let's go back to the, the distance here. Um, how wide is this distance um, in the separations of the fractional dislocations? Well, this, uh, it turns out that this depends on the stacking fault energy. So the energy that you need uh, to invest to create a HCP crystal out of a SCC crystal. And uh, there are two um, processes which have to be kept in mind here. One is that the two fractional dislocations, they start or they want to repel because the angle uh, that they form is 120 degrees. So there is this repulsion of the two fractionals that um, goes with uh, this law here. So the force um, is given by the length of the dislocation segment times the shear modulus and the Burgess vector squared divided by four pi and distance. So the larger the distance, the smaller the force, but there is this repulsion. And then we have also an attraction due to this, uh, the stacking fault formation. And that is uh, given here with this equation. Basically, it's the derivative of the energy with, with respect to the distance. And uh, as you can see here, that here we see the stacking fault energy. So this is the energy exactly in the point where we have the stacking fault. So, sorry for, uh, let's, I show it here. That's exactly this energy here. times uh, the length and the distance. So if we now calculate the force from here and from here and equate it because it has to be the same because we have a force which is repelling the two fractionals and we have a one force which keeps them together. But since one goes with one over D and the other one uh, uh, basically when I take the derivative is not dependent on D anymore, there is a point of equilibrium where the two um, forces exactly compensate each other. And that is then uh, gives me the distance between the fractional dislocations um, of that particular crystal. For example, we see here, if you do a calculation for three different metals, which have quite a different stacking fault energy, silver has the lowest, it has 20 millijoules per square meter. Then we have copper with 40 and aluminum with 140 we can see that the dissociation is quite different. Silver would have the highest with seven. Then we have copper with five and aluminum is just one. 
So that means that the dissociation can be quite different depending on which crystal I look at, and it is chiefly determined by the stacking fault energy. Yes, um, yes, here uh, when we equate the two uh, these, um, formulas here, the two forces, what one gets is then this expression here, that the distance is equal to GB squared divided by four pi and stacking fault energy. The reason um, uh, or the, um, the fact that the stacking fault energy determines the separation between these two partials is of quite large consequence and has led to a lot of investigations on the stacking fault. I will say uh, a little bit more about this in the next lecture or in two lectures, sorry. I'm going to discuss more about the consequences of such atomistic phenomena for the macroscopic behavior and macroscopic plastic behavior. Here I show also an example in TEM. So you see that dissociation really occurs also experimentally. Uh, the stacking fault is here represented by this pattern here where we have these stripes. So we can see that uh, in this uh, particular alloy, which is a copper 7% aluminum alloy, there are really these locations which are all dissociated. Yes, and uh, other evidences also come from atomistic simulations. I show you here a paper, for example, which is from 2008, uh, which has used DFT to investigate this location core structure and also um, uh, the displacement exactly, how they look like in FCC uh, aluminum. They have used aluminum because as we've seen before, it has the smallest dissociation distance and for that reason, it's the easiest to calculate. And we can see that these are about the dissociation distances. Uh, in detail, then it depends whether it's a screw or an edge dislocation. Uh, you can see that the dissociation can be five angstrom or seven angstrom, and uh, which is more or less close to what we've seen here. So uh, it's not exactly. We see aluminum is expected from this simple estimate to have a dissociation distance of about one lattice parameter, which is a little bit smaller than what we see here. But it's an approximate model, this one here, which gives us an idea how large the dissociation distance is. And um, in reality, then, if one wants to have the exact number, one has to do uh, uh, these calculations, which are uh, more precise than this simple estimate. Here, I just want to show you another example. Uh, I hope I can run it. No, it doesn't run. Wait, I will have to step out. Ah, here it comes. This is um, an atomistic simulation. Should run now, yeah. Where um, these locations are being emitted here from the surface. And I don't want to focus so much about the fact this location here move and that they are emitted from the surface here. But more I want to draw to your attention that since this is an FCC crystal, we can see that every dislocation is dissociated, right? You see every dislocation has the stacking fault, which is here shown by the red atoms. And we have the leading, uh, sorry, here is the leading partial and the trailing Schottky partial. Um, so this is what these locations look like when they move. Um, they have always uh, the structure um, that is expected. It's dissociated. We have the two Schottky partials bounding every stacking fault and every uh, image here or every uh, point here is a dislocation which is dissociated. Just show this again. You can see, so he here there's a load being applied in the simulation. And then you see the emission of these locations and uh, that one follows after it, uh, the other, and we have dissociation of every dislocation. Okay, so um, this ends the part on FCC crystals. If you have questions about this, about dissociation, just ask them now so we can also discuss it in more detail if you, if you would like. Okay, seems not to be the case. Then let's move on. 
and go to the BCC crystal. The BCC crystal uh, is now different. Here we have a Burgess vector which goes along the one one direction. Um, it connects two nearest neighbor uh, positions in the crystal uh, that is uh, shown here. It's along the diagonal of the cube. And it, since in the center there's an atom, uh, the Burgess vector is one half of the one 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 uh, direction. The close back plane is the one one zero plane, which is shown here by the uh, dashed lines. And we have uh, a specific thing of BCC crystals is that um, there are several planes which are uh, similarly packed, let's say. So 110 is the closed back plane, but 112 and 123 uh, planes are mm, not far away, let's say, in terms of packing. And that is the reason why 112 and 123 glide planes are also observed. That's well different to FCC. In FCC, we always have just the 111 glide plane. In BCC, we can have uh, um, 110, 112, and 123 glide planes, but the 110 is the most important glide plane and um, observed in, in most situations, especially at low temperatures. Uh, I think all uh, BCC metals have the 110 plane as the glide plane. Yeah, so uh, we can also look at um, the 110 plane on the glide plane like we did before. Here we don't have ABC stacking like we have in FCC, but we have our AB stacking. You see that we have just a red and here is blue layer. And uh, we also have a sort of a hexagonal pattern, but we have it distorted a little bit. So uh, the symmetry here is uh, uh, reduced compared to the FCC crystal. The gamma surface now, I just show here the contour plot is also a little bit simpler in this case of BCC. Uh, you can again imagine we take the red layer and we start shifting around. So once I go and bring this layer exactly to its nearest neighbor, I'm again uh, in the BCC crystal structure. Uh, all other positions are faulted. Uh, they also correspond to certain uh, stacking faults, but there is no stable stacking fault like we had in FCC for BCC. If you look here, the only minima are the ones where really essentially I connect two red points. There is no other local minimum in the contour plot here. That means that there is no dissociation into partials for the VCC crystal lattice. Um, sometimes um, concepts of the FCC crystals are being translated also to BCC. Uh, and sometimes also uh, this is not correct. One also, has, um, because sometimes it's also assumed that also BCC uh, crystal have a, a stable stacking fault. This is not the case. Uh, and one has to remind that. Um, I'm not going too much into details. Maybe I will say a few things about that also in the, in, in, in the two lectures. Anyways, the BCC crystal uh, structure has a specific thing, which are screw dislocations, which uh, play a big role here. Essentially, they are, uh, they are responsible for uh, things which happen in BCC crystal structure, which is, are not observed in the FCC crystal structure, which is the occurrence of several type planes, uh, a ductal to brittle transition, and that the strength is strongly temperature dependent at low temperatures. If you want to read more about um, plastic deformation in BCC, I can really recommend this paper here. I've lost my pointer, I see. Um, <clears throat> um, but important is the fact that screw dislocations play a critical role because um, they have the highest bias stress. And so um, in the stress is limited by the stress that I need to displace the screw dislocation, but not the other dislocations. Uh, and so that has uh, led to a lot of investigations looking closely into uh, uh, screw dislocations because they are so relevant in the case of BCC. I'm going to show you a little bit more details about the screw dislocation now. Essentially, all the remaining part on BCC will be on screw dislocations. 
uh, when we look at the screw dislocation along the dislocation line here, uh, what uh, one can see is that there's not much that reminds you of a dislocation. Essentially, when we look along the dislocation line, all displacements as shown here are normal to the viewing direction and one cannot see the dislocation. For that reason, uh, VTEC has invented this representation with arrows, which tells us something about these displacements of uh, the screw dislocation. Um, the arrows that are shown here show the relative displacement of the columns with respect to each other. Uh, so you see, um, if one just looks at the arrows, um, you see the, the geometric structure of the dislocations um, most clearly. One just has to remember that the arrow points from one uh, column to the other one, uh, but that does not mean that the displacement of the column is uh, with respect to the other one, because the displacement is always normal to the viewing direction. So this is specific to this representation of differential displacement maps. Um, the important thing is to look at the magnitude of the arrows. And if you add all three up, this three one, you get the Burgess vector. If you add these six up, you also get the Burgess vector. So if you make a closed circuit, you will always get the Burgess vector if you add all displacements. Um, since the, uh, the BCC crystal structure has now a symmetry, uh, we can see that the, um, the, the core of the dislocation is not planar like we had before, uh, but we see that the um, dislocation core is spread out into the three direction which makes the core non-planar. And that is uh, essentially the reason why screw dislocations are so important in BCC. The non-planar core structure of the screw dislocation gives it a high bias barrier and therefore also a high stress that we need to displace the dislocation. I want to give you a little bit a historical overview how this specific crystal structure was discovered actually. In 1960, Hirsch has uh, for the first time proposed that uh, the dislocation structure is non-planar. And then there have been uh, quite a lot of investigations in the 70s and 80s, which have investigated this non-planar core structure. And um, there have been several um, investigations with interatomic pair potentials shown here, which has discussed the different structure of the dislocation core. I want to show you here an image taken from this reference uh, where they have shown that uh, the, um, this non-planar core structure can have different geometries. And the geometry is best seen with these differential displacement maps when you look at the arrows. You can see here, for example, that we have a long, short, long, short, long, short arrow, which illustrates that this core is degenerate or asymmetric or polar. So these are three um, terms which, for, uh, these are three terms for the same phenomenon that we see here, that the crystal structure is not symmetric. Here we can see the symmetric crystal structure, which is also called sometimes a non-degenerate crystal structure or uh, uh, crystal structure, uh, sorry, um, non-degenerate dislocation core or a dislocation core with polarity zero. These two cores are the most important ones and there has been a long um, historic debate whether the core structure in BCC is symmetric or asymmetric. <laughs> I wish I will show you a few more slides on this. Also important is a third core, but this one is only important when the dislocation moves and is not so much important when the dislocation is at rest which is what we focus uh, on uh, at the moment. So I go back a little bit to this uh, historical overview. Uh, then uh, there have been refinements done with more accurate approaches, still not ab initio, but uh, more accurate in terms of interatomic bonding. These are called many body central force uh, parameter uh, potentials. And uh, they have found, let me go to this here, they have found that the crystal structure depends on the metal, or they have proposed that it's like that. Uh, if you look here, we see that vanadium, niobium, and tantalum, according to their calculations um, in, uh, published in, in, in this paper here, 
would show a symmetric core structure, while chromium, molybdenum, and tungsten would have an asymmetric core structure. And I quote here uh, another paper uh, by Chris Woodward. He wrote in late in 2005 that uh, while the, the differences in this core structure may seem subtle, uh, small, uh, in the last 25 years, they have been used to explain the variation in plasticity between the group five and group six BCC transition metals. So one has to uh, yeah, appreciate that although you might think, okay, uh, one arrow a little bit longer than the other one, so this will not be a big difference, that um, there have been several papers or several, there have been dozens of papers which have tried to understand whether this change in crystal structure matters for plasticity of BCC crystals. I go back to the historic overview, um, because then in 2000, the first DFT calculations appeared, and uh, they have shown essentially uh, that molybdenum and tantalum have a compact core or a symmetric core. Um, which is in contrast to what they have found here in, in this paper. And all following DFT works have shown that actually the only core structure that you really see is the non-degenerate or the symmetric core structure. Um, yeah, I'm sorry for this, all these different expressions for the core structure. You can find all of them in the literature. So that's also the reason why I showed them here. Uh, I've seen that, uh, I just realized that there is a, a fourth expression also, which is the compact core, which would be the non-degenerate symmetric or the non-polar core. <laughs> so yeah, it is a little bit confusing, but I can assure you that we will find all four uh, uh, terms in the literature. So it's good to um, um, have it all, uh, to know all of them. Okay, here I show the original uh, result uh, by uh, uh, shown in this uh, paper. It was a PRL paper, which has shown that in molybdenum and tantalum, the core structure is symmetric. Um, and so um, the, the still uh, today, the um, knowledge or the level of, 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 of knowledge from atomistic simulation is this one uh, summarized here, that all pure metals have a symmetric core structure and that the um, only semi-empirical methods produce sometimes uh, asymmetric core structure, but that is really a failure of the semi-empirical potentials because DFD is more precise uh, in general uh, won't trust DFT here uh, better. Uh, and so we really uh, think that um, essentially all pure metals have this type of core structure. Uh, unfortunately, this cannot be measured directly experimentally. There have been uh, investigations and attempts to measure really this type of core structure, uh, but it's uh, unfortunately too small to be resolved in high resolution TEM after all, because one uh, also has to uh, measure a displacement which is normal to the plane, which makes this really, really difficult to do. So in the end, uh, these assignments that all pure metals have this type of core structure is a theoretical prediction and has not yet been confirmed uh, experimentally. The only uh, point when the core structure can become asymmetric again is actually by alloying. This is something that I have worked on quite a bit uh, and, and did some research on. So when you start to uh, alloy rhenium into tungsten, what you see is that the core structure becomes again asymmetric. Uh, also, this has not been uh, confirmed experimentally because it's so difficult, as I said before. Uh, it would be very nice uh, to have a confirmation of this uh, fact or of this prediction, but so far, um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, no one was able to really confirm this. Um, I just show here also the result for tantalum. Uh, since all pure metals have a symmetric core structure, it's not surprising that all alloys between tanks and tantalum 
are all symmetric. Uh, if you want to get a similar effect like rhenium, you have to go in the periodic table towards uh, the center of the D band. I just show here uh, the result that we also obtained for iridium and osmium. So also iridium and osmium have a similar effect on the core structure like rhenium uh, or are expected to have a similar effect in the end, these are theoretical predictions. And what was also shown is that uh, cobalt can induce a similar effect also in BCC iron uh, so that you get this change in core structure. And while um, this, all these statements about plasticity in BCC uh, crystals um, that we have, that have been proposed previously, were then wrong because in the end, this is not true, right? So DFT says that all these uh, uh, metals should have a symmetric core structure. Uh, there is one thing which uh, we have proposed that should still depend on this core structure, and that is the glide plane. But I will say a few more things about that in the next lecture. Yes, but uh, for today, I'm done. Since I've gone over time uh, a little bit in the last lectures, today I will stop here and we will go next week into motion of dislocations. Do you have any questions? No. No questions. All right, but if that is the case, I think I'm done. I think it's a good point to stop here because uh, the topic for next lecture is then different. Um, yeah, so I wish you a nice week and I see you in two weeks from now. Thank you very much, goodbye. Bye. Thank you very much.